Okay, I think we're about ready to roll. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna let people finish straggling in. So good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to the start of the spring semester of the Bureau Seminar Series. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Bridget Scanlon for volunteering to be our, our first uh, talk of the year. So happy new year to everybody. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'll, I'll read Bridget's bio and we can get started. So Bridget is a senior research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology. Her current research focuses on water quality issues related to EPA regulations and linkages to social vulnerability through the US with particular emphasis in Texas. This study should help guide water infrastructure funding to improve compliance with EPA regulations. She has co-authored 160 publications, which is incredible. And uh, she is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So if I could remind you all, um, during Bridget's talk, please uh, keep yourselves muted and we will take questions at the end. And otherwise, uh, enjoy the talk. I, I've heard that's a good one. Take it away, Bridget. Thanks. Um, I share my screen. Um, so happy new year, everybody. And uh, thanks uh, for the joining this uh, seminar. Um, I know it's uh, been a difficult a time for a lot of people, and but I was glad to hear that some colleagues that got COVID over the Christmas break, uh, they said it was like a, a mild, uh, you know, fairly mild cold. So hopefully we're uh, moving towards the end of these issues. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, linkages between drinking water quality violations and social vulnerability in the US. And there's a lot of uh, interest in um, and social vulnerability, and so I'll try to describe some of that. I would like to acknowledge uh, my co-workers, um, Bob Reedy, um, who does a lot of the data sleuthing and database analytics and stuff. Uh, Sarah Fackerton, who is a postdoc in our group with a PhD from Stanford, who is a, a geochemist, and uh, Chen Yang, uh, who does data analytics. And um, as uh, just a marvelous uh, person um, currently doing a master's through uh, Georgia Tech uh, on uh, data analytics. Um, the funding for this study was provided by uh, TCQ and originated in EPA Region 6, and we're very grateful uh, for the support. Um, I also would like to give a shout out to our IT folks who have been tremendous in helping us work through COVID. And even when I crashed my monitors on a Friday evening, replaced them that same evening uh, when I went up to the Bureau. So I'm really grateful for all of their support and for recording this um, uh, seminar. Uh, so uh, the um, um, ASC, American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, did a report card on drinking water infrastructure for the US and uh, gave the US a, a grade of C minus. Um, and this is because a lot of our infrastructure is aging with the median age of 45 years uh, for a lifespan of 50 years. And uh, the, there hasn't been that much investment in uh, maintaining infrastructure over the past few decades. Um, Texas also received a grade of a C minus for the water, drinking water infrastructure. So uh, that makes people, so this poll uh, looks at how many people drink tap water. So about a third of Americans drink tap water, a third uh, filter their tap water either through their refrigerator or whatever. And then a third of Americans drink bottled water. And there's a lot of concern about uh, people having confidence that their water quality is uh, good. Um, and um, however, uh, tap water, there are a lot of trade-offs with drinking bottled water because of the environmental impacts. And uh, the bottling companies really target um, low social vulnerability people with about 75% of the ads in Spanish. And these are the people that can least afford um, bottled water, but maybe they don't understand whether their water quality is good or not. Uh, you know, you have the environmental impact, the energy input, the cost, 2,000 times greater than tap water um, and 2,000 times more energy required. So we need to consider those things. Um, I know my sister is uh, an MD in Ireland, and when she see patient, sees patients coming in with bottled water, uh, she rips them apart because she says, what are you doing with that plastic? <laughs> um, 
So a lot of studies have been done recently on water quality issues in the US and Jimmy out of the USGS uh, did a study a couple of years ago indicating that 2 million Americans are drinking um, groundwater with high levels of arsenic exceeding the MMCLs. These are, these are private wells and uh, not uh, subject to uh, federal regulation. Um, uh, then uh, the um, National Resource Defense Council did a report, uh, FEDNIC did a report on watered down justice, emphasizing that socially vulnerable communities were much more impacted by uh, water quality violations than other uh, people in the US. Um, another study by sociologists Tom Mueller and Steve Gasteyer um, uh, showed that um, socially vulnerable communities were also more subject to clean water and uh, drinking water violations. And this shows um, the distribution of um, serious violators from the EPA database, the percentage of community water systems with serious violations. Of course, many of you have heard of the Flint, Michigan issues and uh, the lead uh, issues and the impacts on socially vulnerable communities in Michigan related to that incidence. And then we also have upcoming issues with uh, polyfluoroalkyl uh, substances. And this is the Environmental Working Group map of uh, potential sources of PFAS in the US that should be regulated by EPA in the future. Um, and then the EPA issued, uh, initiated a national compliance initiative uh, two years, a couple of years ago to reduce the number of community water systems that were uh, non-compliant with health-based violations by 25% between 2018 and 2022. So um, I mentioned earlier that there's an increase in funding for um, water infrastructure and uh, the um, Congressional Research Service uh, released a report on January 4th outlining uh, the funding and uh, where it was going. Uh, so in this report, they indicate this is funding that would be provided over the next five years. Uh, they indicated that about 12 billion uh, would go to the clean water state revolving funds and 12 billion to the drinking water state revolving funds. I'm going to be talking mostly about drinking water today. Um, and then lead line replacement uh, pipelines uh, is also going to be done through the drinking water state revolving fund. Um, emerging contaminants, 5 billion, four to the drinking water state revolving fund and one to the clean water fund. And then particular emphasis to small and disadvantaged communities, 5 billion uh, for the Safe Drinking Water Act, which I will be discussing today. And then 8 billion for water recycling and reuse in Western and Western water projects, uh, such as storage in aquifers. And I uh, appreciate Nella Fernando sending me uh, this information yesterday. Um, and uh, so another term that's used to describe this funding is the bipartisan infrastructure law investments that the Bureau of Reclamation just released uh, some information related to that. So the Texas Water Development Board administers the State Revolving Fund and there are great uh, uh, webinars on their uh, website describing the funds and how uh, uh, water systems can access the funds and uh, try to improve their systems. So just to, to briefly describe uh, community water systems, this is what I'm going to emphasize today. There are about uh, 50,000 uh, community water systems. They are uh, a type of public water system uh, that uh, we get water from and that they have at least uh, 15 service connections and serve people uh, almost a year round. Uh, there are also non-community water systems that are transient and non-transient, and these are for schools and hospitals and hotels and stuff, but I'm just going to focus on the community water systems today. Um, there are a total of 150,000 uh, public water systems, so community water systems make up a third of those, but they serve about Nine, more than 95% of the US population. Uh, so they include, um, uh, so um, let me just uh, get, a, so they include the source water, which can be surface water or groundwater. Then oftentimes they have a treatment system uh, and uh, then the distribution system. 
Uh, so the funding that I was just talking about will address source water contamination, improving uh, drinking water treatment systems, and also replacing lead lines, lead, co uh, lead and copper uh, lines distribute in the distribution system. Um, this slide, I emphasize that uh, um, we, we require power to um, provide energy for water treatment infrastructure. And I think Texans became aware of that uh, during Storm Uri this past year when we had the power outages and then we lost water. Um, and then um, this is uh, the output from uh, these uh, systems then uh, goes through wastewater treatment plants. And uh, then that uh, can feed back into uh, the uh, source water. So all of these uh, things are connected and it is important to have a holistic approach uh, to these things. Michael Young attended a conference recently with the US Water Alliance and they emphasize one water, which uh, considers all of these components of the system and um, stormwater treatment and uh, wastewater treatment and, um, you know, uh, and Austin, uh, City of Austin has a, a holistic approach uh, to this also. Um, so I'm going to try to address uh, three basic questions in this uh, presentation. So how do Safe Drinking Water Act violations vary spatially in the US? The EPA um, uh, passed into law the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act in the mid 70s and amended it in the mid 80s and the mid 90s. So this is the act that, uh, that controls the quality of uh, drinking water in public water systems. Um, and then uh, want to look at uh, the linkage uh, between socially vulnerable populations and a Safe Drinking Water Act violations. Um, and then lastly, then with the increased funding by about a factor of six for the uh, state revolving funds, um, how can we optimize the use of these funds to make these systems more resilient and reduce uh, Safe Drinking Water Act violations. So, um, so this is the, the approach we used and um, um, Bob Reedy did an excellent job of analyzing the data. So we are uh, fortunate to have an excellent database from the EPA, the Safe Drinking Water Information System County Level Data on Community Water System Violations. And we looked at any health-based violations in organics, including arsenic, uh, nitrate, uh, fluoride, radionuclides, disinfectants and disinfection byproducts. When we treat water, uh, we can also create violations uh, from the disinfectants uh, and disinfectant byproducts in the water. Um, and then um, we, most of our regulations are based on maximum contaminant levels, so threshold levels. For example, 10 micrograms per liter arsenic in the water uh, that's allowed, or 10 parts per million of nitrate. Uh, but in some cases, we're not able to uh, develop maximum contaminant levels. And then we look at treatment techniques, such as the surface water treatment rule and the groundwater rule uh, to have filtration in other processes to try to reduce the contamination. Um, with increasing uh, climate extremes, floods and droughts, then uh, that can add additional hazards to uh, community water systems that we need to be aware of and that EPA emphasizes. Um, we look at social vulnerability parameters then, and these are subdivided into four themes. Um, the first is uh, socioeconomic, poverty, unemployment, income and education, and then sociodemographic, young and old people, people with disabilities and single parent households. Then there's race and uh, poor English speaking, and then housing and uh, transport. Uh, so we looked at, used all of these data then, and the methods that we applied, uh, spatial analysis using a GIS mapping and a choropleth maps uh, that I will show shortly on uh, safe populations exposed to Safe Drinking Water Act violations by county over the con uh, contiguous US. The temporal analysis, we look at the persistence of um, water violations over time using the last three years of data when the, uh, when the regulations were fairly stable. And um, uh, Chen Yang uh, wrote scripts to uh, apply random forest and shop uh, approaches to determine the relative contributions of different social vulnerability parameters to highest linkages and explaining uh, the uh, relationship with uh, violations. 
So looking at uh, the future outlook then, um, the EPA emphasizes uh, risk and resilience approaches and requires community water systems to develop plans for that, where they serve more than about 3,000 people. So uh, to become more resilient, then you need a portfolio of options. And uh, some of these uh, include short-term coping strategies like flood barriers. Uh, and like we saw from URI, having off-grid power, making sure that the community water systems are uh, listed as critical infrastructure so that they're not subjected to uh, uh, brownouts or blackouts. And then people who had gas stoves, they could follow the boil water notices because they could boil their water with natural gas. Uh, you know, point of use treatments, uh, you know, if you have a Berkey filter in your home uh, and uh, smart water quality monitoring systems. Uh, longer term adaptation strategies then um, focus on merging systems that are non-compliant with nearby systems that are compliant. So consolidating systems, uh, upgrades to water treatment plants, um, enhancing uh, technical managerial and financial capacity. Um, uh, looking at uh, treatment requirements and uh, future requirements related to uh, climate extremes, climate change, uh, new regulations, for example, for PFAS or other contaminants and uh, different treatment options and funding those. And then another aspect is workforce development because we're losing a lot of the people uh, that are trained in this and uh, some utilities are losing up to half, they're expected to lose half of their staff in the next 10 years. Um, so I thought, you know, we uh, submitted a paper to, uh, to uh, a journal recently and uh, came back and said, nothing new, nothing interesting, thank you very much. So I thought I would start uh, the uh, presentation with some questions because after the fact, you think you knew this all already anyway. So um, uh, if you are not multitasking and looking at your email, maybe you can record what you think is the right answer to these uh, questions on a piece of paper. If I was more sophisticated, I would have organized this very early, early on, but I only developed this this morning. Um, so what is the dominant source of drinking water quality violations in community water systems in the US? Is it inorganics such as nitrate, arsenic and fluoride? Organics um, related to industrial contamination, pesticides or herbicides, uh, radionuclides, uh, pathogens, um, uh, disinfectants and disinfection byproducts. Um, I'll give you the answers at the end of the talk. Um, which state has the highest number of community water systems with any health-based violations? Um, is it Texas, California, Florida, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Washington, New Jersey? Take your pick. Um, is the number of community water systems with any health-based violation increasing or de has it been increasing or decreasing in the past few years? Um, and then which type of community water systems are more vulnerable to contamination? Are they systems uh, sourced by surface water or groundwater? Are they large systems or small systems? Are they rural systems? Are they um, groundwater systems uh, uh, that are small? Are they groundwater systems that are small and that are in rural settings? Um, and sorry, I have an error there. Um, which regions of the US have high social vulnerability index? What is the distribution of the social vulnerability index that the CDC developed for the US? And where are the highest levels? Is it the Southwest US, South Central, Southeast, Midwest, Northeast, Southwest and South Central? Um, or all the Southern states? I should have put that as an option possibly. Um, do all regions with high social vulnerability index have high incidence of health-based violations? Yes or no? Uh, what controls relationship between social vulnerability and community water system violations? Is it the distribution of contaminants that are primary control? Is it uh, the fact that uh, socially vulnerable communities can't deal with the, the violations and so that the violations persist? Or is it both? And the last question then, 
um, which social vulnerability parameters are most highly related to health-based violations in community water systems? Is it race, poverty, education, housing, or transport? So um, if you can answer all those questions correctly, then you can zoom out. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think that you don't know the answers to some of these, maybe you can continue listening. So going through the results of our study then. So this is uh, the social vulnerability map, uh, the most recent one from CDC from 2018. And, you can, and it's, uh, we're showing it by county. The, um, and you can see red areas are areas which have high social vulnerability index and the blue are low. So you can see all the southern states have high social vulnerability. And uh, the Midwest has, has low social vulnerability and the Northeast. And then there are scattered counties throughout the West that have high social vulnerability. Uh, please don't complain too much about my quiz because as I said, I, I, I developed it this morning, so it may not be too accurate. So then there are 14 parameters that are included in social vulnerability. Uh, and these are subdivided into four themes. Um, socioeconomic status, so poverty, unemployment, income, and education. Uh, household uh, sociodemographics, old people, young people, people with disabilities, single parent households, um, race and language, minorities, um, speak English less than well. And uh, theme, housing and transportation, different types of housing and uh, whether they have uh, vehicular transport or not. So um, this is uh, probably one of the main maps that I will emphasize uh, in the talk today. And um, it uh, links, um, it's a GIS, a choropleth map uh, that links social vulnerability uh, with um, uh, system violations, Safe Drinking Water Act system violations and shown by county. And so the green counties are counties with no um, violations over the past three years. And uh, so you can see there are a lot of green in the Midwest uh, and um, in uh, the Southeast. And uh, do you, is that what you would expect? We were surprised by this. Um, I thought that we would see a lot of violations in the Southeast and the Mississippi related to nitrate from agriculture. And it's uh, surprising that we don't. But that nitrate is denitrified and reduced. Uh, and so we don't see it in the groundwater. Um, and so um, you can see, um, and then the different shades of red are for the different tercels of social vulnerability. So the, the lowest the, um, white to gray is uh, the lowest third, orange is in the middle third and the darker uh, higher, more orange, uh, the upper third. And uh, so you can see many of the counties in the Southwest have the darkest color, so they plot in the highest tercile of social vulnerability, uh, which is increasing uh, darkness and the, high, the darkest color, uh, which is the highest social uh, SIDWA violations. And these are the populations in the counties impacted by SIGWA violations and linkage to social vulnerability. So you can see uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, many counties within Texas, Louisiana is almost all plotting in that uh, upper uh, um, uh, region here and Oklahoma. Um, and then many counties in the Northeast also have high SIGWA violations but they have low social vulnerability. Um, so they show in the orange color. Um, and so um, then here we show the populations impacted. So these are the populations with no um, uh, system violations for those counties uh, throughout the US. And then, um, so for example, uh, 12 million people uh, are plot on the um, have the high uh, plot on the upper third of system violations and highest social vulnerability index. So about one in ten people are exposed to a health-based violation. So that's any violation, 
uh, that includes inorganic threads, uh, everything. So about 12 million people are exposed to, to any health-based violation um, uh, or, uh, within the past uh, three years. And then when you look at the lowest one, 0.07 million people, so about a hundred times more uh, socially vulnerable people are exposed in the highest uh, quarter. So socially vulnerable, um, social uh, vulnerability is important in explaining the distribution of um, health-based violations. So if we look at uh, the direct spatial relationship then between violations in the y-axis and social vulnerability in the x-axis. So we see in the uh, Midwest, we have low social vulnerability and low violations. So a lot of green and um, um, there. And in um, the uh, Southwest and South Central US, we have high social vulnerability and high system violations. So if that was the, the only case, then we would say there was a high relationship between uh, social vulnerability and uh, violations. But in the Northeast, we have high violations and low social vulnerability. And in the Southeast, except for Florida, we have high uh, social vulnerability and low violations. So there is not a direct one-to-one -one relationship between system violations and social vulnerability. But where we have violations, there is a strong relationship between uh, high social vulnerability populations and system violations. So you have to have, so we have very few violations in the Southeast, but we have high social vulnerability. So you have to have the violations uh, first uh, in order to have uh, the relationship. So applying sharp analysis then, um, uh, Chen found that uh, poverty um, was the highest contributor to explaining the relationship between social vulnerability and system violations. And the second uh, parameter was minority. Uh, and the third was education, no high school diploma. And then you can see all the other parameters decreasing below that. Um, so this was very nice approach to evaluate the different contributors um, to the linkage between social vulnerability and health-based violations. So which, um, uh, so here I'm plotting the um, size of the community water systems and EPA subdivides them into these different ranks. So very small systems serving less than 500 people, uh, small 500 to 3,300, um, 3,300 to 10,000 is medium, large 10,000 uh, up to 100,000 and greater than 100,000. And uh, then this is the number of community water systems in violation. And then here we show uh, the systems are in rural settings, um, suburban and urban settings. So you can see most uh, violations uh, are in the very small and small categories of uh, community water systems. So these are more vulnerable to uh, violations. And then um, they are in predominantly in rural and uh, suburban settings. And uh, this sort of uh, makes sense because these very small systems have a very difficult time uh, dealing with violations and having the uh, rate base uh, to uh, bring in treatment systems and to manage uh, violations. So which um, uh, parameters contribute most to community water system violations? So, uh, here we show the number of community water systems and then the population served. So we see that disinfectants and disinfection byproducts um, account for the largest percentage of community water systems that are in violation. So by treating water with disinfectants and disinfection byproducts, we are creating the largest uh, percentage of uh, non-compliant systems. Uh, so we are trading um, an acute uh, violation which would be related to pathogens for a chronic violation related to these products. The second highest category are inorganics and radionuclides accounting for about 20% of community water systems and a groundwater rule, which is groundwater under the influence of surface water, which accounts for another about 20%. The revised total coliform rule accounts for 15% of system violations surface water treatment rule 10%, lead and copper 7%, and organics 
It's interesting to me that uh, EPA about the, the regulate 91 contaminants, 53 of them are organics, but they account for the smallest percentage of community water systems that are violated. So this is a very uh, interesting paper by Xing Fang Li, um, showing the trade-off uh, between acute risk from pathogens versus a chronic risk from disinfectants and disinfection byproducts, and how we can how we should try to balance uh, uh, these issues. So, because uh, DBPR or disinfection byproduct rule violations are the largest contributor, I'm showing these next. So you can see the highest concentration of DPPR violations in the South Central US. And this is partly related to climate and requiring more residual chlorine to be retained uh, in the water. Um, and uh, you can see Oklahoma and uh, Louisiana and East uh, Texas um, and many states in Arkansas and extending into the Northeast Kentucky and, uh, but, uh, uh, and those states to the Mid-Atlantic states. So this is related to uh, organics uh, in the water and then how we treat it and uh, the residence time of the water in the system. So larger systems uh, are more vulnerable. And so when we say to uh, treat the water, if a small system has a problem, they should uh, consolidate with a larger system. But when you make these very large systems, then you can create these uh, DPPR uh, violations. So again, you see large population in this uh, top quadrant here, 4.3 million, uh, relative to 0.05 uh, million in this lower uh, quadrant here. So socially vulnerable people uh, much more exposed to DBPR violations uh, than uh, others. Uh, any inorganic violation, and this includes arsenic, nitrate, uh, RADS, so you can see these are highest in the Southwest and uh, South Central US, California, uh, Arizona, and um, uh, parts of Texas. And this is uh, related to, to uh, many of these arsenic and fluoride um, uh, are um, derived from naturally occurring sources from the geology, geogenic source uh, for these. And, um, and nitrate is uh, from uh, ag, uh, pro, um, from agriculture. And that is a big issue in the uh, Central Valley. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, the geology contributes a lot of these naturally occurring contaminants in the uh, Southwest and South Central US. Um, so uh, then if we look at uh, which state ranks highest in terms of number of community water systems with violations in the US. So um, I just put all of these here together. I don't want to make a career out of it, uh, but I just want to say any health-based violation, Texas ranks highest, followed by Louisiana and Pennsylvania. Legend copper rule, Texas. And uh, Steve Walden was trying to explain to me that we don't really have, so some people were surprised by this and we need to look into it more because it suggested that uh, the lead and copper is more in not the pipes, but uh, just the, the uh, uh, linkages between the pipes. And if people ran the faucet for a little uh, while that they would uh, eliminate that issue. Um, uh, DVP uh, rules, uh, Texas, uh, then followed by Oklahoma and Louisiana. Uh, the arsenic rule, uh, California ranks highest in terms of number of systems that are violating within the past three years, followed by Texas and Arizona. Uh, nitrates rule, Texas, then followed by California and Oklahoma. And then the revised total coliform, Pennsylvania and Texas, um, followed by Arizona. It's unfortunate that this doesn't represent football and we were ranking so high in that. Um, so one of the reasons that Texas ranks highest in terms of number of systems and um, is because they have the most community water systems of any state. So uh, they have uh, 46,000 um, active systems and the next closest state is California with almost 3000 systems. But that's not the only reason that Texas ranks highest uh, for many of these also, but it's a contributing uh, factor. But it means that we have more systems to deal with then when we try to bring them back into compliance. And I think that's important to consider. Um, 
So then looking at the, the time series of violations, and this is the problem getting worse for better. So this is any health-based violations. And so you can see yeah, peaks in different years, mid nineties, uh, big increase um, um, early 2000s and another uh, spike in, um, in mid 2015. Um, so uh, you can see this is a disinfection byproduct rule violations and then DBPR, the first rule was enacted in this period. And so you see a big increase in system violations related to DBPR one and another big increase related to DBPR uh, two, phase two of the rule. Um, in organics, a big increase around 2005, 2006 related to arsenic when we went from 50, uh, an MCL of 50 micrograms per liter to 10 micrograms per liter. Um, and then uh, RADS, you know, gradual increase and fairly stable. Um, groundwater rule, which was enacted in 2009. And so you can see sort of gradually increasing over time. Um, surface water treatment rule, the uh, highest in the mid nineties and then uh, decreasing but remaining fairly stable. And E. coli, I am just showing you cola rather than um, total coliform and then lead and copper. So you can see that the time series is a controlled to mostly uh, the number of systems in violation over time is controlled uh, a lot by the, the regulations. And so we see this uh, recent decrease, uh, which is controlled uh, by systems uh, uh, accommodating the disinfection byproduct rules but also a change in the uh, re uh, revised total coliform rule. So it's um, the, the time series then is a um, reflection of the regulations. So here you can see the arsenic and the big increase, uh, but we still have a lot of systems that are not compliant in terms of arsenic violations um, in the US. Um, so many come into compliance over time uh, develop treatment techniques. And one of the reasons for this is arsenic is coming from the geology and it's pervasive. And so it's not, you can't just drill another well and, and avoid it or drill a deeper well because um, the, um, it's uh, throughout the region. Uh, it's interesting to see that, uh, you know, there's a big increase in nitrate in the um, uh, violations in the early nitrates, but it has remained fairly stable which suggests that we're not really getting a good handle on nitrate uh, in groundwater systems, uh, fluoride and others. So then one of the big uh, causes of a decrease in system violations uh, in recent years is the revised total coliform rule. We used to use uh, total coliform as a proxy for um, uh, violations in the past, but then in uh, 2015, we revised that and now we use E. coli. They did report E. coli in the past. And so you can see E. coli uh, is much lower and uh, the revised total coliform essentially corresponds to E. coli. Uh, and they feel like E. coli is a much better proxy and that they were losing consumer confidence um, with the using total coliform and it was not a good indicator of um, system violations. So, the, so that's the time series. So we looked at the space and the time, and now I want to look at persistence. So uh, the arsenic rule was uh, in, uh, enacted in 2006 or became effective in 2006. And so here we're showing uh, data by county on system violations. So you can see that we have a lot of violation around the Great Lakes and in the Northeast, California, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and Texas. So looking at uh, the uh, recent data then, you can see that a lot of the systems in this region um, have disappeared. And so these systems have been able to install treatment to manage the arsenic violations. But we still have high persistence in, in this uh, regions where we have high social vulnerability. So it suggests that maybe the socially vulnerable communities are not able to develop the treatment systems uh, to get rid of the arsenic violations. And we looked at the uh, persistence. So Sarah Fakrajin uh, looked at uh, the uh, persistence of uh, system violations. So the black shows the number of community water systems that are violating any health-based violation over the past uh, uh, three years. And so this is uh, in the first quarter, a lot of systems uh, go back into compliance where we have persistent uh, violations over time. And this persistence 
is strongly correlated with the, the median social vulnerability index of these uh, systems, of the counties with these systems. So a correlation of point, uh, R square of 0.83 between persistence and uh, social vulnerability. So it suggests that these uh, socially vulnerable communities are not able to develop treatment systems or manage. Uh, and, and so they're much exposed to these contaminants over a much longer time period. And this is the same uh, for uh, disinfection byproduct rule violations in organics and arsenic uh, that are persistent and strongly linked to social vulnerability. But there are other rules then where they um, uh, come into compliance after one quarter or two quarters. And this is the surface water treatment rule, groundwater rule, lead copper rule. They don't persist over time. So uh, EPA has a, a risk uh, and resilience framework, which is also used for uh, addressing climate change issues. And they use this for managing water quality in community water systems. So if we look at uh, the risk issues, which is the vulnerability of the systems um, and their system weaknesses. So we the hazards that we uh, have to consider are, we saw um, geochemistry, uh, we saw uh, geogenic contamination, arsenic, uh, RADS. Um, we saw um, uh, denitrification of nitrate in the Southeast, uh, eliminating that issue. Uh, land use issues related to ag in the Central Valley and nitrate. Uh, lead in distribution systems um, are in the fittings in those systems and um, lack of treatment. And then also we're having to deal with compounding issues like climate extremes like flooding and drought. And uh, so for example, in the Central Valley, they see three times higher nitrate during drought than they do in other regions. And I just pop into the uh, next slide and go back to that previous slide. We here we are plotting the social uh, vulnerability and uh, the um, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act violations in the background, and then showing the map of uh, flood exposure a uh, hundred year flood. And so you can see along all these coastal uh, regions and up the Mississippi and in Florida and the Central Valley, there is a coincidence then between uh, flood exposure and um, system violations and high social vulnerability. So uh, in this talk, I've emphasized, uh, you know, the linkages between social vulnerability indices and uh, system violations. We saw uh, poverty was the strongest uh, uh, contributor uh, followed by minority and high school education. And then uh, community water system characteristics, very small systems in rural communities were more vulnerable. And um, the exposure then is the population and uh, the persistence. So how can we uh, make these community water systems more resilient uh, and to mitigate uh, the risk of these uh, violations? So we subdivided this into short-term coping strategies and long-term adaptation. So uh, oftentimes we have boiled water notices uh, um, or uh, ask people, communities to use bottled water. Um, if people have point of use treatment systems like a Berkeley filter or whatever, then uh, maybe they can handle some issues uh, because not all contaminants are, with the, are regulated by EPA. Um, so there are other organics and other things that can be in the water uh, that are not listed in EPA. And then there's a big push to, to use smart meters for water quality monitoring uh, to help um, understand the, these issues better. Long-term adaptation strategies. Um, uh, there's a lot of emphasis in consolidating systems and, and smaller systems linking up uh, to larger systems. So Steve Walden contacted me over the holidays because Fredericksburg had some uh, small systems with you know, 19 or 20 connections that had nitrate issues. And uh, I hope that in the long term, they would connect with the city of Fredericksburg. But in the meantime, they need to uh, try to address the nitrate. And he thinks it's related to septic tanks and shallow wells. Um, for community water systems in building new water treatment plants, weatherizing the systems, having backup generators, EPA emphasizes this during floods like our uh, winter storms, if they had uh, uh, diesel generators or other systems to back it up, uh, merging systems, replacing lead pipes, there's $15 billion in the uh, infrastructure funds for replacing lead pipes. 
And then with the recognition that we're going to be losing a lot of the workforce in the future. So training these and retaining the uh, workforce would be very important. So there are a lot of agencies involved uh, in these uh, programs and the, the Texas Water Development Board Fund uh, manages the state revolving funds, both the Clean Water and the Safe Drinking Water Act. TCQ uh, regulates the community water systems and um, EPA Environmental Finance Centers. There are six of them in the US and ours is in New Mexico, um, Heather Him Himmelberg there. Then, uh, Dorothy Young at TCQ plays a huge role in the Texas Water Infrastructure Coordination Committee to help small systems um, get the funding to manage their non-compliance issues and works with a lot of the agencies listed here. EPA and the CATMUS group uh, within uh, working with EPA, rural communities, uh, RCAP uh, and Communities Unlimited in Texas, Texas AW, uh, American Water Works Association, the, Steve Walden donates his time to an USDA Rural Development and uh, Water and Wastewater Equipment Group, you know, who are really looking at the increased infrastructure funds. And when talking to them, they said a lot of the technologies have to be manufactured in the US, which is going to be a problem uh, because much of the water treatment stuff is manufactured in Germany or Japan or other countries. Uh, the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators, which I think TCQ um, is uh, involved with, and uh, National Rural Water Association. So a lot of groups, uh, a lot of different sources, but for a small system with very little technical staff or no technical staff, it's really a big uh, hurdle and a big challenge uh, to uh, get into compliance and to understand how to work the system. So to summarize then, how do Safe Drinking Water Act violations vary spatially? So we see a lot of health-based violations in the Southwest and South Central and Northeast US related to uh, naturally occurring contaminants, arsenic and radionuclides, and also uh, nitrate uh, in the Southwest related to ag. Um, disinfections and disinfection byproducts uh, concentrated in South Central US and extending into the Northeast. Socially vulnerable populations, so in, in the US, one in 10 people are exposed to a health-based violation within the past three years. So that's 10% of the population. Uh, populations in high social vulnerability category are 100 times more, have 100 times more exposure to health-based violations than those in the lowest category. Um, and social vulnerability is linked to persistence of violations and indicates that uh, these uh, communities uh, cannot uh, uh, develop uh, approaches to manage uh, the um, violations. And then optimizing infrastructure funding and developing a roadmap for this. I think uh, I just talked about short-term strategies and long-term adaptation strategies and the California SAFER program can uh, provide a template for some of these ideas. Um, so these are the answers to the uh, quiz and uh, let me know how you did and uh, if you have, and maybe I've gotten some of them uh, wrong myself, or if you have any ideas. So I would like to thank the TCQ and EPA for funding and allowing us to conduct this work and would be glad to answer any questions. Great, thanks a bunch, Bridget, for a really awesome talk. Um, it looks like there's a number of questions in the chat box here. so. Um, do you want to open that up and, and read those questions out loud or, or shall I? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, if people want, maybe people can unmute themselves and ask them. So, Michael, if you would like to ask um, uh, the, um, um, your question. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess I was unmuted. Um, yeah, Bridget, great talk. Um, my question was really on the sophistication of the regulatory agencies within different states and whether they are sort of uniformly identifying violations and then reporting them. Um, I'm, I was more struck by the Southeast, which has um, lower violations, but higher social vulnerability. And I know from the Superfund program back in the 80s and 90s that the Northeast had a much, much higher number of those sites because the agencies were more effective at having them identified. And is, that, is there a way to take that into account or were you able to kind of control for that in the, in the statistics? 
Well, so so we're just looking at the end result, you know, which is how many systems are violating and, and then, you know, how that relates to social vulnerability in those counties. And um, so I, I think, uh, you know, you bring up some issues um, which we identified when we looked at tribal communities. So there are about a million people um, uh, on community water systems, uh, um, uh, tribal communities. And um, uh, there are much higher percentage of those people, maybe 30%, where it's 10% uh, uh, generally in the US, one in 10 people are exposed to health-based violation. Uh, it's 30% for those tribal uh, communities. And uh, we did see some papers where people had identified uh, that uh, enforcement varied uh, among uh, states. And, uh, and we do see, you know, for example, Pennsylvania has a, um, uh, interprets the groundwater rule uh, differently and then has higher system violations. So there are other factors uh, that contribute. So states, because most states have primacy in um, uh, applying these regulations, uh, then there are some state-to-state uh, uh, -state differences in some of them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Jack, or, uh, so are there yeah, Jack, more systems? My, yeah, Mike, uh, I think you may have answered in the succeeding slide, but the one showing that the, the small, many more small systems are in violation. But I was wondering, I presume there are many more small systems. So percentage wise, are the, are the small systems more likely than the larger systems also? A kind of a per capita thing, but it's per system. Right. So I think uh, that, uh, um, you know, reflects two things, uh, Jack. Uh, so there are many more uh, small systems uh, than large systems. And then most of the small systems are sourced by groundwater, um, whereas the large systems are predominantly surface water. And so that uh, uh, affects the linkage between uh, the source of water and system violations. Um, and uh, the very small systems are uh, mostly in, in rural areas. Um, and uh, so that also, uh, and, and with the disadvantaged communities. So there are a lot of um, uh, uh, factors that um, uh, compound some of these issues, Jack. Right, I was just wondering, what was the percentage of the small systems that failed, you know, significantly greater than the percentage of large systems that failed? You know, Jack, I, I, I don't know if we've looked at this. <laughs> and so that's why we do these talks so that we get these uh, questions and then we can go back and look at the data. I don't know if Bob Reedy or anybody else can, or Sarah or anybody else uh, can address that. Uh, but I certainly will go back. Uh, um, but I mean, as far as the, the uh, population served, uh, you know, uh, when a large system goes out of violation, the, the population served is much uh, greater. Um, Alex, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I, I, I think my question is sort of, kind of similar to uh, Michael's and uh, uh, Jack's question. I mean, so the first part is mainly about whether uh, all the systems were uh, weighted by the size and the uh, population served. Uh, right. Uh, no. Um, and um, uh, getting back to what Michael was asking too, I mean, uh, the number of site visits. So EPA has a dashboard and it tries to improve transparency and stuff. And so uh, they indicate a number of site visits and stuff like that. And I know Steve Walden has been working with uh, small systems in Texas and uh, finds that sometimes maybe some systems have been uh, have not had site visits in, in several years. So, uh, and with workforce issues and COVID, it's probably gone off the scale. So, <coughs> sorry. Um, so no, we did not uh, wait that. And maybe you have some other ideas about how we can, um, uh, you know, uh, analyze the data, Alex, uh, that we can discuss further. Um, are there any other questions in the uh, so, uh, chat box? Um, Maria has her hand up. Oh, go I ahead, have... Maria. Maria, lovely to see you. And Hi, Bridget, how are you? Your great, great. Uh, how are you enjoying your new, new job? Oh, I love it. I love it. But and I have found this presentation so informative. Um, and so I just let me introduce myself a little bit. So for those of you who, who don't 
Don't be, I, um, I finished my PhD there at UT um, at the LBJ School of, of Public Policy in um, 20, uh, this last summer, I, I can't even remember what year we're in, 2021. And Bridget and I, Bridget um, um, was really, re really kind to review some of my research and give me some, some input. And actually Bridget, my uh, paper got published. So I'll send you the link for that. But, but um, now I'm actually the, um, the commissioner for the International Boundary and Water Commission. And so um, I, I found this really interesting, uh, every, uh, especially the information that you had on the social vulnerability index. I, I plan on using that because I've tried to advocate for more funding to be brought to these vulnerable communities along the, the US-Mexico border. But I, I do, based on my experience, I, I do have two things I wanted to comment on with regards to that. And that's based on my research that I did for my dissertation was when, when I was, I, my, my dissertation focused on research on, on the colonias, right? Right along the Texas border. So these are the ones that have that, that small rural, that small, that vulnerability index. And one of the analysis that I did was I looked at population growth. And so typical design criteria requires you to, when you're building a system or you're, re, you're is that you, take into account growth. But many of these, these small community systems are not growing. In fact, they're getting smaller, right? And so when it came to wastewater systems were implemented, many of them had um, oversized systems. So one of the things that I, I think is really important that is, as some of these um, um, issues are addressed, that you can't look at the typical design standards that are used for sizing because one of the things that constantly came up in the interviews that I did, I did about a hundred, I, I interviewed about 70 uh, water, water system, water utilities. And one thing that really came up on a regular basis was that they were having issues with aged water in their system because they did not have the population to circulate the water appropriate. And so they were having to flush their system because the water was becoming stagnant within it, right? So that was one of the issues that came up on a regular basis. And this is just something you, you that, 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 that because of the interviews, you discover that, right? And, and, I, and I'm sure that affects some of the water quality um, issues that are going on. And then the, the other thing that I found is, is that even though there are these grant funds that come in and they help them implement these, these systems, there's really no small programs to help the small communities. And a lot of them require, all of the programs that are out there seem to require bonding. Um, going out and getting bonds, um, going out and and these big um, efforts to try and and um, and grant grant application processes. So the small community systems don't really have the institutional capacity to leverage those funds, and much less to go issue bonds. So you know, the, there these are really big hurdles for community systems to overcome is that in lack of institutional capacity to address these issues. Not only do they not have the the user base to sustain, you know, any sort of debt financing, but they don't have the capacity in house. Um, and before Texas used to have an ombudsman program that would go out and help these communities, you know, and, and they eliminated that program. So unfortunately, these these communities lost that access. So it's not just about having the programs. It's not just about um, you know, you know, bringing them to the to the well to drink, but you have to teach them to drink, right? In the sense that you have to work with them and help them. I know Communities Unlimited somehow uh, plays that role, but I don't know what their funding is or, or if there's a good strategy for addressing the small community systems. So I just thought I I, I throw that in. I'm not sure if that's helpful or not helpful. Oh, that no, that that's huge, and and I I do understand, you know, that they need some handholding, and 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 there's oftentimes money left on the table in the past because the right. system can't uh, access it, and um, uh, with the state revolving funds, which is getting most of the funding, they require financial, managerial, and technical pro uh, these small systems to have all of right. that, and and many of them don't. So I think we have to look at some new areas. And uh, I look forward to reading your paper and uh, to being in touch. So thank you so much for joining thank us Thank you, today. Bridget. Um, thank you for letting me know about so, this. Um, we also have a hand up for Janelle Crane. 
And this, I, I think, will be uh, Janelle. This will be the last question. Just to let okay. you know, Bridget, and then we'll be out of town another time. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of along the same lines as um, a few of the other um, comments earlier about um, uh, which public water systems have violations in primacy agencies. So I know that um, you know in Texas there's you know a robust primacy program over the drinking water um, systems. Um, and there's very little monitoring and reporting violations so that um, the water systems are reporting their sample results to the state at a high level. So the monitoring reporting violations, so that's the opposite side. So there's others, there's systems that are not submitting their data or their samples to the state primacy agencies. So I'm wondering if you could incorporate that into this also. So, you know, here in Texas, we have, you know, very little monitoring reporting violations for the organics, inorganics, um, radionuclides, um, because that, that data is coming to the state on a regular basis. But other states don't have that. They're getting, they're not getting any data, so they don't know what's going on in their public water system. So it would be interesting to know across the United States that information also in here, because with the Safe Drinking Water Act um, uh, framework, you know, people know that they have monitor or they have violations. So they know mm -hmm. that they have high arsenic. They know that they have. Um, or the, uh, let me re re rephrase this. The public water systems are required to tell their public that they have these issues. So, you know, these communities in Texas um, and California and Oklahoma and stuff are getting these public notices, hey, they're drinking water, you know, there is issues in these certain circumstances. And so that raises that public awareness so that maybe, people are willing to do something, willing to pay more money for their water um, to raise those rates so that they can get. But many of these other systems across the United States that don't have that robust primacy program may not even know that they have the health-based violations. They don't even know. So I think- Right, and, and that, yeah, that, that's an excellent point, Janelle. And we do have the data on monitoring and reporting violations. And we can see then if there's a relationship between that and, and the system violations and try to tease that out. So excellent point. And uh, we have the data, we just haven't looked at it in that way, but we, we can readily do that. Uh, yeah. So thanks everybody for uh, joining today and hope 2022 will be good and that you all stay healthy. And thanks Kelly uh, and Dina and others for organizing this. So. Thank you again, Bridget, for a great talk. And uh, I hope that everybody else found it as informative as I did. And just as a reminder, um, so this was the first talk of our spring uh, semester of the Bureau Seminar Series. And uh, next week on January 14th, uh, Buddy Price will be giving a talk on his work in the Permian Basin. So I'll see you guys then. Thanks very much. Thank you.